Daphne has certainly been eventful. In my opinion, carrying out Vitra's request and assaulting the Tower of Zot should be our highest priority. I agree. While I still have questions concerning the Forum and their grand undertaking, we have all but exhausted our avenues of investigation. Simply pressing them any harder on the subject will almost certainly result in our expulsion. Therefore, I suggest we explore the Ethereal Sea connection by way of a letter to Master Matoya, then make our way to Thavnair. I wonder, even with the protection these talismans afford us, what can we hope to achieve once inside the tower? According to Orenvold and Fordola's report, they were unable to free the Emolja. Worse, their attempts triggered the tower's defenses, which led to a summoning of Luna Afrit. What does it tell us that the spires even have such defenses? Simply pulling a prisoner from the wall is fatal, thus the direct approach is doomed to failure from the outset. Any further measures to dissuade such actions seem unnecessary. Unless, of course, there is a way to free the prisoners without killing them, then it stands to reason that any intruders would be met with overwhelming force. The towers appeared throughout the world in but the twinkling of an eye. Twas by magical means these structures were raised, I surmise. A spire thus conjured must needs be maintained, and I suspect an arcane catalyst, some manner of core, doth lie hidden within. Destroy the core, and the tower ceaseth to be, thus liberating the captives without harm. So we can hope, and I would prefer to enter the tower with a working theory than with no plan at all. Assuming Estola's reasoning is correct, the chances of the defenses remaining dormant are small to none. Any primals will have to be dealt with, and defeating one will likely only lead to the summoning of another. Our every victory will only compound the prisoner's suffering. May we not then divide our forces? Those proficient in healing will focus on sustaining the captives. That duty can be covered by Urianger, Kryl, Yostola, and myself. The remaining Scions will proceed with the search for the core. Admittedly, this strategy puts both parties at greater risk, but it should bolster our chances of saving the Arca Sobera by a considerable margin. If you're to fight Primals, then you'd best have at least one healer with you. And I am more than happy to fulfill that role. I found wielding a sage's armament to be rather intuitive, and look forward to testing them against a more challenging foe. It seems we have a plan. All that remains is to carry it out. I will inform Rads at Han of our movements, so let us make our preparations and regroup near the tower. The military post in what's left of the Hamsa hatchery should serve as a convenient staging. That sounds perfect. And remember, the experimental etherite at the confluence is there for those who need it, so there's no excuse for being late.
Is everyone all right? We fortified the captives with what magics we could. Have the defences been disabled? All appears quiet for the moment. Lower floors were disturbing enough, but this place feels... wrong. The ether is heavy and thick, like wading through a quagmire. I believe we stand in the tower's beating heart. What sayest thou, Ishtola? I see it. Ether siphoned from the land runs up through the spire, flowing to a single point. This is the core we seek. Yet something is off. As large as this structure is, it siphons far more ether than is required to sustain it. Tis as if the core is feeding on the energy, consuming it. I need to take a closer look. Curious. There is something there embedded inside the core. A man's limb. This is what we came to destroy? Yes, if you will be so kind. That should be the end of it. What now? My theory that the tower might come crashing down following the core's destruction doth appear to be correct. Bully for you! And how are we supposed to survive the fall? Below. The floor beneath our very feet dissolves. Brace yourselves! I pray I'm not too late. By my reckoning, we're still on the island where the tower stood. But it is as if it never existed. Hardly a scratch. But how? Raha wove a levitation spell at the last moment. Large enough to catch everyone, it would seem. That explains the lack of obvious injuries. The expenditure of so much ether has taken its toll. He will need plenty of rest, but should otherwise be none the worse for wear. Then the immediate problem is what to do with our new friends here. They'll be much changed for their time in the tower. Even if their bodies are intact, I doubt we could say the same for their minds. Ah, 
Angelo and I will take care of that. I have every faith in you, Alizé, but there are just too many for you to treat alone. We'll send at once to Eorzea for more porksies, and call on the local mages to lend a hand. Hail, Scions! We were watching the tower when it simply disappeared. What happened here? The threat is banished, and thy people delivered. They are, however, in need of treatment, and we of a secure locale and helping hands to assist us in its provision. You shall have all this and more. Come, let us convey these unfortunate souls to the city.
Are we the last to arrive? I hope we've not kept you waiting. Not at all. Your comrade is feeling better, I trust. Much better, thank you. Harness remedies are certainly potent in more ways than one. One becomes accustomed to the taste, although I hope you never have cause to do so. Pray, take your ease. Full glad I am to see you all unharmed. Valiant silence. For your heroism, you have my boundless gratitude. You cast down that dire tower and set free its hapless captives. You cleanse their souls of its corrupting influence. No words of thanks will suffice. In place of platitudes, I offer a bounty of warding scales. Pray accept your due reward, along with the goodwill of Radzatan. Alchemists throughout the land were put to work in the forging of your talismans. The finished ones have been collected and now await you at the High Crucible of Alchemia. Present this letter when you are ready to take them into your possession. We are humbled by your generosity. Know that the inventive wisdom of Radzat Han will be vital in restoring serenity to our star. Every single one of those scales came from you, didn't they? You must still be in such pain. Tis of no moment, a mere annoyance compared to the dreadful suffering inflicted upon this land and its people. Albeit brief, my involvement in the Dragonsong War afforded me a glimpse of the myriad sorrows which consumed both dragon and man. Though you were half a world away, such tragedies as befell your kin must have affected you deeply. And yet, you chose to live among men. In the age when that conflict first bloomed, my choice had already been made. In some distant place, man slew dragon, and dragon slaughtered man. Yet no hate could I muster for those smiling faces which did look to me for guidance. Not even my brother's righteous rage could rally me to his cause. I huddled here, secret and still, hoping against hope that which I had built would remain untouched by the chaos.
would seem we share the same desire for peace, Great Vritra. To that end, I wonder if we might trouble you with another question. The Telophoroi are intent on recreating the final days, an apocalyptic event which we know to predate the sundering of the star. As the longest lived among us, know you aught of this terrible cataclysm. Nay, when war and strife drove my sire from his home, he crossed the great expanse with only our unhatched eggs as company. He alighted upon a shattered source, its thirteen reflections long since scattered beyond the rift. Of events preceding his arrival, he knoweth not, save that which Hydralin hath deigned to disclose. I see. So again, tis the inscrutable Hydralin to whom you must look for answers. Seek you to divine the will of this star. If so, I have a tale which may afford you some small comfort. Tis a story from my youth many, many years ago. To my sire I once posed the question, of all the stars in the sky, why didst thou settle upon this one? To which Midgard Summer did reply, "'Twas the last bastion of hope." He believed, so long as Hydaelyn endured, so too might dragonkind. Solemn and portentous were his words. What deeper meaning they held, I could not, dared not pursue. Tis a stone I've left unturned ever since. Yet take you solace in the knowledge that whatsoever Hydralin does strive towards, tis an ideal which hath earned my sire's conviction. Thank you, Vritra. You've given us warm reassurance in a world gripped by cold uncertainty. While I'm sure we all have a great many questions, I think it's time we collect the talismans and be on our way. Our fight against the Telophoroi is far from finished. We must take our leave. But please do inform us if we can provide any further assistance. Prithee, a moment. There is one whom my sire hath judged worthy of honor and respect, the one known to men as Aorzea's champion, this hero of renown and rumor, tis thee.
More terrible still is the attrition wrought upon thy companions, as they are swept up in the storm of thine existence. Take heart and protect them well. They will be your strength and your salvation. The hope thou wilt need come the end. Even cowering behind my curtain, I know the suffering of the powerful. I have watched my siblings driven mad by loss. of suddenly collapsing, and when you didn't follow us out. Tis I who must apologize. I have to change your champion over long with idle chatter. Go. At war's end, I pray I welcome thee back into my hall, where together with thy joyful comrades, you may toast your triumph. Thank you. 
These are the talismans we were promised. Yes, and I made a quick count. There are far more than we could have hoped for. Enough to outfit an entire company of soldiers, in fact. Considering the involved process, that they were able to manufacture so many in such a short span of time is nothing short of a miracle. Once we have distributed them to our allies in Eorzea and the Far East, we'll have a fighting chance to bring down the other spires, just as we did with the Tower of Zot. Or we could use them to invade Garlemald proper and strike directly at the Telophoroi's base of operations. Of course, we would need to consult with various Alliance leaders before such a drastic measure could even be contemplated. To which end, I could set out forthwith and present the idea to each of our allies in person. Pray allow me to undertake some few of those journeys. I find myself restless and in need of purposeful duties. I can head eastward. Bosnia and Dalmasca are just a short hop from here. And Doma's Shinobi network should come in handy for passing on the word. We shall share the burden then. Meanwhile, I think it best that you and the others take the talismans back to the Baldessian Annex. We must keep them safe and secure until we've decided upon a course of action. Please, I must speak with you. Nidana, you're awake. Yes. When I spoke with the carer at my bedside, she told me that one of the scions, a young woman, had cleansed me of the tower's corruption. It seems I'd been asleep ever since the treatment. But when I awoke and learned you were all still here, I knew I had to come. As you said, Nidana was captured only recently. Such a brief exposure is swiftly cured, so I tended to her before we gathered at Megaduta. And I am truly grateful that you did. I cannot thank you enough. All of you, for everything you've done. Destroying the tower, rescuing our people. You've saved Havnir from an awful fate. Yet who has truly saved whom? Due in no small part to thine inspirational courage, the alchemists were successful in reproducing warding scales of proven efficacy. Replications of thy work now stand ready to travel across the seas unto the hands of those who might wield them against this rising evil. The talisman? Is this true? Oh, I was so groggy from sleep. I didn't even think to ask. Oh, our great work sent across the seas. It was worth it. Oh, it was all worth it. Look at that. Its color is completely changed. What do you have there? How unusual. I wonder if the effect is a reaction to Akasha. 
I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that term. Akasha? It is one of the unseen energies defined by Hanish alchemical theory. Though a gross oversimplification, some describe it as an essence influenced by feelings. You imply that it is distinct from ether? Our foreign scholars often conflate the two, but we see them as separate concepts. Ether is an energy which permeates the land. It exists within animals, objects, even the air we breathe, affecting all through which it flows. Akasha, on the other hand, exists in a domain beyond our reach, a gift bestowed from on high or torn from the heavens in some traditions. Akasha can neither be created nor destroyed. It is beyond our power to purposefully alter or manipulate. The only thing observed to influence it is an abundance of, I want to say, spiritual emotion. As a veteran of the battlefield, surely you've experienced moments of desperation or exaltation when you've transcended the usual limits of your capabilities. That is a manifestation of Akasha, the invisible essence harnessed by heart, mind, and unyielding spirit. I really must hear more about this theory. Our disciplines are based entirely upon the idea that ether is the fundamental form of all energy. I'm glad my haphazard explanation has piqued your interest. But even for us, Akasha is a somewhat abstract field of study. A lack of practical application lends itself poorly to formalized research. Which is why my analysis of your flower can amount to little more than idle speculation. I am sorry. Nonsense! You have nothing to be sorry for. Your insight is much appreciated. Shall we depart for Charlian then? I will see to it that the talismans arrive at the Annex. And we will be in touch once our talks are concluded. I suggest you rest while you can. From here onward, sleep is bound to be in short supply.
Take heart and protect them well. Good, you're here. You haven't eaten yet, have you? We've bought quite a spread if you're interested. Only the finest dining from the last stand. wonder, we invited Astinian as well, but he refused with a rather grim-faced, no thank you. I suspect Charlian cuisine is not to his liking. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. Perhaps our lone wolf just needed some time apart. What, to perfect his brooding stare? Next time, I'll drag him out by the ear, sit him down in front of a Charlian feast, and see that he eats every last bite. An excellent idea. Of all people, warriors must take proper meals and rest, if they are to maintain a healthy constitution. Poor Astinian, beset on all sides. Speaking of one's physical condition, Mistress Cryle, I hear you recently played literal host to Heidelin herself. Ah, and what an experience that was. Tiring, yes, but no lasting harm done. If anything, I should have liked to speak with her longer. I've not felt a hint of her presence since. Heidelin instructed you to carry that flower, yes? Twill be your guide, test and proof of your conviction. And then something about seeking joy in darkness, was it? Come to think of it, isn't that what happened with Nidana back in Radzat Han? The flower did seem to radiate a joyful glow, as if reflecting the elation we all felt, the relief of a people with renewed hope. Indeed, and in turn I felt buoyed by that radiance. It was akin to spotting a beacon and knowing we were on the right path. I know we've not yet triumphed over the Tlophoroi, or learned the full breadth of the Forum's plans. But even within the midst of our struggles, we find small moments of joy to sustain us. Rare and hard won, perhaps, but it is this pursuit of happiness that gives us the strength to carry on day after day. Swift the spoils, though I recall that levitation spell of yours was quick enough. Mm, only barely. And even at my best, I'm still too slow to wield it effectively in battle. Mayhap I simply require more practice with this new magic. You unearthed it from the depths of Numenon, I presume? Aye and from a veritable mountain of arcane tomes at that. It was necessary to facilitate my solitary explorations. Or 
To put it simply, you used it to sneak around the Forbidden Archives. I... Uh, yes. Well, after a fashion. Shelves, they're too tall for me. And I could hardly move the library's platforms without attracting attention now, could I? Oh. oh. I'm not that ambitious, but it is pleasant to idle away the hours every once in a while. Enjoying the bracing cold, I see. Do you not own a warm coat or a cloak? Something in fur? Or fashioned from the skins of your enemies? Or... Well, never mind that. I come to you once more as the bearer of bad news. Our tower in Thavnir has been toppled. And I need not tell you by whom. Given how many we have at our disposal, the loss of a single spire is hardly fatal to our plans. It does, however, slow the rate at which we siphon the ether. If they continue to preoccupy themselves with the towers, then all will be well. But should our foe prove bold enough to strike at us here, then the timing becomes... Questionable. Our foe is bold enough. Of that, I can assure you. Ah, uh, yes. Very well, then. I suppose I must prepare a proper welcome. Honestly. Talk of your nemesis is the only thing you seem to enjoy. Does nothing else spark your interest? Hmm... No. All else is... equal. Equally tedious. Equally disappointing. The world is a tepid bog into which we sink, too weak to thrash as the mud clings to our eyes and fills our throats till we blissfully choke. But then came the light, blinding and pure and hot, so very hot, enough to set my soul aflame. I basked in the afterglow, until the void yawned once more. And then I knew the muck would never claim me again. There was naught for me ahead, so I drew the curtain on all that had come before. Burn, burn, let the whole star burn. 
I will have my contest. I will reclaim my moment. Wonderful that the emptiness of death has not dissuaded you from committing your life to its pursuit once more. I don't know whether to envy you or pity you. You question my disinterest, but what of yours? Despite your noisome antics, I sense you take little pleasure in this endeavor. Mercy, my lord. Such pointed barbs from one who barely acknowledges my existence. Nevertheless, you are mistaken. For I do find this part somewhat enjoyable. You see, when I was mortal, I would always have the same dream. It was a fragmented thing. Disjointed. All the faces incomplete. The setting, too, was unknown to me, so I thought it simply a fantasy of my sleeping mind. Until one day, I realized it was showing me the truth. Much as your dream of the final days enlightened you. And soon, very soon, the rest of the world will see the truth of my dream, too. Yes, I think that is something we can both enjoy.
pray we have not caught you at an inopportune moment. We wanted to offer our thanks for your kind words in the forum. Well, I could hardly let that Inquisition... I've always believed that curiosity should be nurtured, not stifled. Thankfully, a majority of my colleagues agreed. A slender majority, aye, but a majority nonetheless. Had the vote not gone our way, we would be having a very different conversation, if any at all. Though I'd like to think you would have not given up on our cause. I'm told you paid a visit to the Annex afterwards. Yes, that's right. I was hoping to speak with the grandchildren of my dearly departed friends Gallif and Louisois in a less doer setting. But it seems I just missed you. I still can't believe how much you've grown. If only your grandsires could have seen the way you presented yourselves to the Forum. Why, if fair brought a tear to my own eye. You must have the patience of a saint, putting up with this lot and their antics. Never mind Matoya's prize student. Luckily, I know a thing or two about managing unruly younglings. If you ever need advice, don't hesitate to ask. If I may, there is a rather more pressing matter we wish to discuss. What can you tell us of this duty that the Forum must fulfill? Nothing, I'm afraid. Like all humble servants of the Forum, I am sworn to secrecy. Or rather, I couldn't tell you if I tried. Our duty is of the gravest importance. Furthermore, if the particulars were made public, it would incite widespread panic. As such, those entrusted with this duty have been bound by an enchantment, which prevents us from speaking of such matters without the express permission of the Forum. How is that even possible? <laughs> it's been some time since I last gave a lecture. Please, take a seat. We shall begin by reviewing the fundamentals of etherology. The ether, which imbues us with life, can be categorized into three forms. Two are of the incorporeal sort, the soul and the memory. Can anyone tell me the third? Not entirely inaccurate, but nor is it the answer I was looking for. That would be corporeal ether. This is the form with which the layman is most familiar. Consumed by even the simplest of daily activities and replenished by the food and drink that sustain us, this form of ether is in constant flux. In contrast, the ether that comprises the soul is rarely subject to dramatic change. The same can be said for memory, as the two are intrinsically linked. Picture the soul as paper, and memories as words written upon it. 
Now, what would happen if that paper was doused with ink? The same type of ether as comprises the memories. It would blot out everything that was written. Precisely. We would be unable to recall the memories, and any activities that depend upon them would be hindered as well. In fact, this exact phenomenon was observed on a vast scale not so long ago. And what might that have been? The Seventh Umbral Calamity. The people of Eorzea vividly recall Bahamut breaking free of the Lesser Moon and raining hellfire down upon the realm. But no one could seem to remember the events that followed immediately afterwards. Indeed, to this day we have yet to determine whether it was an unintended consequence or a deliberate act. The enchantment which binds me and the rest of the Forum is based on a similar principle. And yes, it is a contravention of the Shaolin prohibition against the practice of memory manipulation. Only when a new member is inducted and told of our great duty are they subjected to the process. A necessary evil. You have my word that it would never be used to manipulate the populace. I should hope not. But can this enchantment be dispelled and your memories restored? If nine-tenths of our members give their approval, then the process may be reversed. Then, and only then, would we be able to speak freely to others of our sacred duty. Barring that, we must wait until we return to the Ethereal Sea. For there we will be purified, the blots upon our souls washed clean. drift apart and dissolve. Rather defeating the purpose, I suppose. But there are those memories that are indelibly etched upon our souls, some believe. What happens after that? We are reduced to pure ether, coalesce with that of others, and create souls anew. Alternative schools of thought assert souls remain whole and return to the corporeal world, reborn into another form. Both theories have their proponents. Personally, I consider each equally probable. Well, I think that's enough education for today, now that I've given you some food for thought. Or rather, an entire banquet. I would remind you that although I'm unable to assist you with certain matters, the resources at my disposal may still be of use to you. I'll arrange for you all to be given the run of Phenomenon. Of course, as associate to our alumni and the students of Baldessian, 
this privilege is extended to you as well, my friend. Oh, and I suggest you speak with Ki Aliapo. She's well known among the artisans of Charlian, and her network of contacts may prove useful in your search for knowledge. I wish you all the best in your pursuits, wheresoever they may take you. <laughs>